Hi, I'm Brent Waters, and I'm going to be talking about adaptively sound SNARGs from indistinguishability obfuscation. This is joint work with David Wu. So succinct non-interactive arguments, or SNARGs for MP, have gathered a great amount of interest in the cryptographic community. In this type of a system, we have a prover who wants to convince a verifier of a statement, uh, the validity of a statement. And moreover, the prover wants to be able to do it in a one-shot fashion. So for example, the prover will run the proof algorithm, which produces a proof pi, then it just sends this over to a verifier or any number of verifiers, and they can validate it using the verify algorithm. Now, there's two essential properties of any succinct or SNARG system. Uh, first of all, we want it to be sound. That is, the verifier should only accept a proof if the statement is actually in the language. Um, secondly, we want things to be succinct. It would be easy to just simply send over the witness, that would be trivial, but we want the proof size to be polynomial only in the security parameter, and it should be essentially independent of the length of the statement and the witness. Now, for being able to obtain SNARGs, there's really two different types of paths. Uh, the first path is to rely on the random oracle heuristic, or what's commonly known as some type of uh, knowledge um, assumption. And this was first um, initiated by the work of Killian in 92 and McKellen in 94. And I should say there's been many, many different works um, in the community along this path over time. However, we might want to ask ourselves, well, what if we want to be able to get a solution from a standard assumption, including, uh, let's say, sub-exponential hardness is OK? Well, in that case, um, this road is much less traveled by. And there's really, um, leading up to our work, um, one main work doing this, which was um, to be able to get non-adaptively secure SNARGs from indistinguishability obfuscation uh, was due to work of myself and Amit Sahai in 2014. Now, one might at first think that obfuscation itself sounds pretty strong, perhaps a non-standard assumption, but I remind everyone that due to a breakthrough work in 2021, um, we now can base indistinguishability obfuscation from a set of well, what they call, the authors called well-founded assumptions, which seem to be approaching what we would consider um, standard assumptions. However, the drawback with the second path is that it only achieves what we call non-adaptive security, which I highlighted here. Um, this means that the statement that the attacker picks to forge on must be independent of the common reference string. That is, in the security game, uh, the attacker first declares which statement he's going to try to um, forge or um, create a false um, proof for, and only then does he later see the common reference string. Um, this belies the reality that in real life, an attacker can look at the common reference string and perhaps in some way it might inform in what statement to um, do this on. Now, so the purpose of this talk is can we get adaptive um, security? And when I look at the previous slides and we see that sub-exponential hardness is okay, the first thing that might come to people's mind are, is can we just get it in a somewhat of a trivial way using complexity leveraging to get adaptive security via guessing? Okay, so if we zoom in on what sub-exponential hardness means, um, if we think of polynomial hardness as being when we want security against all polynomial attackers um, to have advantage at most negligible. Sub-exponential hardness is a stronger property, but still believed to be reasonable um, by the, the community at large, which is that all po uh, polynomial attackers have advantage at most two to the negative lambda that C times some negligible function, where we typically think of C as a constant somewhere between zero and one. Now, the way we usually use sub-exponential hardness in, in such a setting is that let's first think of n as the length of our statement. What we're going to do is take our security parameter lambda and add to it n and raise it to the 1 over c. So here we get a larger or new, secure, new or inflated security parameter, but this will still be um, polynomial in both n and c. Now, if we run the primitive um, on this new security parameter, um, sort of post-inflation, what we get is the hardness is that all polynomial time attackers should be, have advantage of most um, two to the negative n times negligible um, in lambda. And what this allows us to do is since, since we get this much stronger property, um, if we just take a, a, a guess, let's say that we could be have a loss of two to the n width or run over two to the n hybrids, the attacker's advantage should still be negligible. And in many different settings, it allowed us to go from selective security or static security to um, adaptive security um, just using this very um, basic trick. So you might, might ask, well, does it work here? Does it work in the SNARG world? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, it does preserve security in the, way, uh, in the way I'm talking about. However, this inflation of the security parameter grows things with n. This includes both the common reference string, 
for which it's okay. We don't demand any succinctness from this, but also grows our proof size um, at least proportional um, to n, which violates our succinctness co condition. So it looks like we're not going to be able to solve the problem that easily. Okay, so the challenge in coming up with the solution to this is that attacker will come up with a false proof of what I'll um, loosely call a forgery here. And we want to be able to use it um, for, break, for breaking, uh, let's say, a one-way function or some assumption at the end and use it no matter what, what it is. We don't want to have to just guess and then hope that our guess is right. Okay, so our solution is going to um, rely on two different primitives. Uh, the first one is called indistinguishability obfuscation. And the idea of a code or circuit obfuscator is I'm going to start with a circuit, run it through a randomized obfuscation um, process, which will produce a different program, but what, what will be functionally equivalent to the first. That is that for every single input, it will give me the same output. Okay. And the security property that I'm going to want is that if I start with any two programs which are functionally equivalent, let's say might compute things differently, but for every single input, they end up with the same answer. An attacker, let's let's say if a challenger flips a coin, decides which one to obfuscate, an attacker won't have better than a negligible chance in um, guessing um, the negligible chance over one half in a guessing which one he um, obfuscated. Okay, so to be a little more formal, this can be an algorithm called obfuscate, randomized algorithm, takes as input uh, the security parameter and the circuit, outputs a program P uh, for correctness. Again, for every single out input, um, um, Z, C of Z and P of Z will agree on the outputs. And then for security, if I have two programs which happen to be functionally equivalent or two circuits, um, one cannot computationally distinguish um, whether I'm obfuscating circuit C0 or C1. Uh, the second primitive I'm going to build off of are um, punctual pseudorandom functions, or PRFs. Here, the idea is like a, a pseudorandom function. I'm going to have a keyed function, but I will also have the ability to puncture it or kind of hurt it, hurt its ability to evaluate at just one particular point, but it should work everywhere else. So the syntax for this is that there's going to be a key generation algorithm that would take as input the security parameter and my input and output length that I want for the function and produce a key k. I should also be able to puncture it, which makes it um, work at a, at a point x star of my choosing, which makes it work to ever except for x star. And then there should be an evaluation algorithm, uh, which will work at either um, with either punctured key or the original key. And again, what I'm going to want to have here is punctured correctness, that the, uh, that the original key works the same as the, the punctured key works as well as the original key at every point except for x star. And moreover, for security, we're going to say, with the punctured key, I cannot computationally distinguish the output um, at the punctured point from a completely random from a completely random value. OK? OK, so in looking at a solution, we're going to first take a look at that solution from 10 years ago due to myself and a Sahai from indistinguishable obfuscation. And this one will be non-adaptively secure. And then we'll see our solution um, after this. Okay, so they're, in their solution, they're gonna we're gonna run the key gen algorithm and have um, the punctured PRF take inputs of length of n, which is the statement length, and outputs of the security parameter, and we're also gonna consider two different programs: one used by the prover and the second one used by um, the verifier. So the gen proof algorithm has hard coded into it the relation R along with the uh, the key K that I just generated, and its inputs would be a pair of the statement along with the witness. Now, if r of x w is equal to false, this program just aborts and doesn't give anything. But if it's true, it evaluates and outputs f of k comma x, which I'll kind of call the um, signature for that particular statement. OK, the verify program is going to help me verify whether such a thing um, worked or not. Um, it will take as input a, um, a statement x. And what it will do is first evaluate the PRF on x. And that will give me a pre-image in a sense. Then I'll run the runway function, which I'll denote with lowercase um, f here. And this will give me the image of a one-way function. Now, if I were to give these programs out in the clear, this uh, system would be uh, completely in would be completely insecure. So instead, what I'm going to do is obfuscate both of these um, both of these programs and give that obfuscation as part of the common reference stream. And to prove and verify is now pretty easy to prove. All I do is um, simply um, simply take my, my statement x and w and run it into the obfuscated program. It gives me a proof pi, assuming it was a correct witness. And then to verify, I run the I, I give as input the statement to this um, gen instance program. It gives me a post image y. 
And then I just check if the one-way function um, evaluated on pi is equal to y. And so I, I accept, if not, then we um, reject. So this gives us a really simple way where essentially the, the obfuscated proving program just will give a signature essentially to you if you're able to convince it that it's true. And the signature is much shorter than, could be much shorter than the statement or the witness itself. Okay, uh, the disadvantage of this though, uh, I won't go into its analysis, but if we do its analysis, the analysis really depends fundamentally on being able to know which place the attacker is gonna forge or which bad statement it's gonna um, give a proof on ahead of time. Okay, so now we wanna be able to say, can we take, you know, maybe learn from some of these ideas and come up with an adaptively secure version? And to do this, I'm first actually gonna do some of this um, parameter or security parameter inflating that I talked about earlier, but instead of doing it in a very coarse and maybe not so smart way, I'm gonna do it in a fine grained way. So here, there's gonna be um, security parameters for two underlying primitives, the obfuscation and the PRF. And for these, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna inflate them essentially as I talked about before. Now, this inflation is gonna cause growth with N, but the growth is only gonna impact the common reference string which won't actually um, affect the, the uh, succinctness of the proof itself. Second, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the security parameter for the one-way function or essentially input length for the one-way function. And this, I'm just gonna keep the same security parameter size I had before. And this will mean that the proof size is gonna be independent um, of the statement, uh, statement length. So we won't get that blow up problem we talked about um, earlier. Okay, so let's take a look at our construction. A construction follows in a similar vein to Sahai Waters but with some very interesting um, uh, twist to it. For example, for the key gen, I'm gonna have two key, it's gonna generate two function PF keys, K0 and K1, either which might be used to sign a particular statement. I'm also gonna have a selecting key, which outputs a bit, takes as input a statement, outputs a bit, and it's gonna tell me which of these two keys to use to sign for it. Okay, so if I have this gen proof program, when it takes this input, um, uh, let's say the statement X and witness W, it's going to first throw, again, if, if, this, if R of X W is equal to false, it's gonna throw it out and reject um, as before. But otherwise it's gonna um, use the selecting key to determine a bit B and then um, use and then use a uh, case of B on, on S. So use F of case of B of X to get Z. So it's gonna, it could be possibly using to choose between these two different um, signatures. Um, second, there's going to be another gen instance program, which now has two of these keys, and it's going to generate two images. The first one is going to use capital F of K0 of X, and then one the one-way function on that to get Y0. And then similarly to get Y1, it'll take um, capital F of K1 come X, and then run the one-way function um, on it and output both of these. Now to prove, again, I just um, input X and W, and I get this proof pi, which is like before with the bit B telling which one I used. And then to verify, um, it's gonna output two post images and use the one that, and, and check against the one that uh, matches the proof. So essentially we just have kind of two copies of everything going through. Okay, now due to time limitations, I'm only gonna be able to give the, I think the analysis is pretty interesting, but we'll only be able to um, look at it at a pretty high level. So the first thing we're gonna try to establish in this proof is that if an attacker wins, that is it produces a, what I call a signature, on, um, on a false statement, it will at least have some non-negligible probability of doing it what I call off path. Okay, so what I mean is suppose an attacker comes up with X and then uh, pi such that it ver such the attacker wins, that is it verifies and the statement's false, for it to be off path, it's gonna use the bit B that is opposite the selecting bit that the prover would have chosen if it were a true proof, okay? So the first part, um, so the first part of our analysis is going to be showing that pretty much if the attacker wins with probability epsilon, that uh, where epsilon is non-negligible, that um, it will be off path with probability about epsilon divided by two, ignoring some negligible factors. Okay, so that's gonna be the first part, saying the attacker will win off path. And from this point forward, we're only gonna be interested when the attacker wins off path, okay? And the main idea here is that the reason we can make this argument is that the selection bit is computationally hidden for all X not in the language. So if an X is not in the language, that proving program should just always be aborting on that, on those types of inputs. And so the attacker doesn't at least get a direct view of, um, of what that bit is. Now, of course, we need to go into a real analysis, which involves different hybrids to establish this. 
The second path, the, sorry, the second part of um, of the proof is that for all these off path things, you know, wh whether it's a, um, a true statement or not, we're gonna plant what I call re-randomized puzzles, um, re-randomized puzzles, re-randomized outputs of one-way functions off the path. Okay, so to see understand what I mean by this, let me introduce very briefly um, what re-randomizable one-way functions are. So imagine that we have a um, one-way function image, uh, what I call Y star. What we can do is in a re-randomizable system is re-randomize it to get some new one-way function um, Y till. And this has two important properties. First of all, we have perfect re-randomization that the distribution after re-randomization should be the same as just getting a fresh evaluation of a one-way function to begin with. And then secondly, we wanna be able to have some type of correctness property where let's say y tilde, um, r tilde is uh, the pre-image of a re-randomized one-way function. And I also know the randomness, in this case, I'm calling it t, that was used to go from y star to y tilde. Um, then what I can do is actually recover a pre-image not just of the re-randomized one-way function, but of the original of the original one y star itself. Okay, so I can kind of go back, use this re-randomization re knowledge um, to kind of uh, re reverse engineer uh, what um, the original uh, solution was. And I'll just say, that, you know, these do come up in uh, um, fairly fairly frequently using number theory. Um, one very simple example of re-randomized um, one-way function comes from the discrete log uh, problem. Okay, so the, the solution, the second part is after we establish that the attacker will, if it works at all, it will win off path. What I can do is um, add in one more punctual PRF here. And I'm gonna start in the analysis with getting the image of a one-way function Y star. And what it can do with this, it's gonna take a series of um, different hybrids and indistinguishable obfuscation and so on to do forth to do so. But what I do is I can change it to a new gen instance. I can indetectably change this to a new gen instance program where when for the things selected by the um, uh, selected by the input bit will be done just as before. But this y sub one minus b for the things what I'm calling um, off path are not going to be evaluated as before. What instead what I'm going to do is take this um, uh, one way function image y star and re randomize it. And essentially the, the argument for the second part is the attacker's advantage um, going going into what we saw going into the construction will be about the same as it is after I make these changes. Okay. Now um, for the final part, I'm in a pretty good position. Because if the attacker does win off path, it's going to be it's going to give me a solution. It's going to give me the preimage to a one way function to one of these re randomized instances, and then essentially I can use my knowledge of how it was re randomized to solve this one to solve this one way function. So essentially, what this means at the end of the day is that no matter where in any of the possible um, false instances the attacker gives, as long as it was um, off path, I can actually use it to just solve. Um, one one-way function. So I kind of take one challenge and essentially intuitively uh, pl plan it everywhere. Okay, so just to conclude, I want to say, so one neat thing was that um, the SNARG problem was um, open to get adaptive security for 10 years um, from that um, previous solution in 2014. And it's neat to uh, start to get a uh, resolution to this. I'll also mention two other works that, that have um, um, been uh, that have recently occurred that are important. Um, what is this work of M, um, MPV appearing at, I think, at Crypto of 2024? They actually do get adaptive security, um, also from IO, but in the more limited setting where there's a designated verifier. That, that is, the common reference string would be set to only work for a particular, um, to convince a particular verifier and not any other verifier would believe it. If you want to convince someone else, you should have to do um, a separate um, setup for them. Uh, the second uh, work I'll mention is due to uh, myself and Mark Zandri. Uh, subsequent work and that's actually also appearing at uh, Crypto24. And what we do is we have, an, a, instead of the re-randomized, uh, the first part is essentially the same uh, for the analysis, but the second part, we do an alternative analysis based on lossy functions that, so we don't use re perfect re-randomizable um, one-way functions. Instead, we base it on um, lossy functions that I guess lose a lot of information. And this leads to a learning with error solution that was not viable before because we didn't know how to do perfect re-randomization from that. Okay, th uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.